Sorry about that. I ended the other video too soon. So this is part two. Uh, picking up from this uh, discussion. So again, in the long run, everything can change. And so, um, the other things that you may have remember calculating when you had taken Econ 130 was the calculation of averages versus marginals. And that's going to play um, part, of a part of the discussion here as well um, when we're talking about um, uh, how the graphs will look. So with averages, as the term implies, we would be looking at the total output and dividing that by the quantity of the input. And for the marginal product, we'd be talking about the change in output that occurs as you change the input. So change versus total amounts. Or, yes, actually I didn't see it here, but, or you can just look at it right there. If I read the rest of the slide, then I could have just seen that. And that's what we see here in this table, right? You can see here that the labor is changing by one unit in this column here. The capital is fixed, so this must be a short run analysis with the capital having some sort of contracts, but the capital is not changing at all. And as I change my labor by one unit from one to two, then I got 25 more units of output. And that's that 25 right here. As I went from zero to one, I went from zero to 15. That's 15 additional units of output. That's right here. The averages are just your total amount of output. Let's say 40 divided by two. That's the 20. That's right here. So, you know, you can just mathematically calculate this table. And what it does for us is it allows us to then graph things out. <laughs> now, what you'll notice here, let's just zoom in here. Sorry. This has all the potential for me to screw something up. Never good. So look at this. This is initially total product is initially increasing at an increasing rate. And then we hit some sort of inflection point around here where it's then increasing at a decreasing rate, meaning it's getting flatter and flatter. And then over here, it's decreasing. So one of the questions we'll need to look at here for the total product is why is that happening? Why is the total product have three regions here, increasing at an increasing rate, increasing at a decreasing rate, and then finally decreasing. <coughs> and we can see here, if we graph this out, the average increases and then decreases, and then here, the marginal product, which is reflecting the rate up here. So, right, it was going increasing rate, then decreasing rate, then falling. So, here is where that first region where it was increasing at an increasing rate, then increasing at a decreasing rate, and then decreasing. <coughs> And did they just use two slides to
Right, they just use two slides to describe the same thing. Okay, so I just did that, so I'm just going to keep going on here. Um, the graph looks like that when you have one input changing and one input not. So that's the way that the production function looks like, like this, in the short run, where one variable is fixed and the other variable is not. Okay, so in general, what we see here is that the marginal product curve, which is in this case would be the marginal product of labor curve, is telling us, <coughs> again, for this case here is change in output over change in quantity of labor. Here would be output divided by number of workers. So it's just a straight division. And the relationship between the two curves, for the relationship between the two curves, the way that you see this here is that the marginal product intersects the average product at its maximum. And then the point where the, um, the point where the marginal product crosses the X axis, that would be the point where the total product starts decreasing. And so long as the marginal product is below the average, that's where the average then starts to decrease. And when the marginal product is above the average curve, that's what's bringing up the average. So that's where the average is increasing. Now, again, to look at why things are shaped the way they are, What you see here um, in terms of the marginal product, and this is showing, this graph here is showing three different marginal product curves. What you see is that it's initially increasing and then decreasing. Or I should say increasing at an increasing rate, then increasing at a decreasing rate, and then finally decreasing. Again, raising the question of why is that the case? Well, the best explanation we have for this is just think of your own working life. And in your own working life, you've probably, ex you know, um, uh, you've probably experienced something where there is a certain kind of input to help you do your, your job that there aren't very many of that capital unit. So you have, um, you know, for instance, the very first worker hired gets to use the copy machine exclusively because they're the only worker. They get to use the printer exclusively. They're the only worker. The phone is theirs. Now, let's say with that business you have, you add a second worker. Even better, right? Because it's not like you use the printer or the phone all the time. You could share the phone and you could share the printer. And it's not going to really set you too far back in terms of productivity. In fact, now you can kind of split up the tasks between the two of you and get even more done. <coughs> but now imagine that you have 10 workers, right? 10 workers sharing the same um, same printer, same uh, phone, it's going to make things pretty unproductive. The space is going to be very loud as everyone's talking. And so that would be the region where the total product is increasing now at a decreasing rate. And then eventually, you get to be such a big organization 
that you have like fake workers or like people stealing, workers stealing because the place is just so big. <coughs> and so that's kind of what a business then has to always be thinking about is how productive is it going to be to add an additional worker? And then what do I need to equip that worker with to make them productive? So right, so in my case, when I got hired, I got my own computer, I got my own phone, but I did not get a printer. We all share a big printer. Okay, so that's what's been decided, right? And I think when you get, when you move up, in the world, you get your own printer eventually, but I'm not that high in the world. I don't have my own, um, I don't have my own printer. <coughs> so, I have to walk about, I don't know, 50 feet to the shared printer. I guess it's deemed that it's not, but every floor of the, of the Saunders building has its own printer. So, right, so we are big enough that each floor has its own printer, but not so big that each room has its own printer. It's all, in some sense, a productivity determination. The only other thing you can do in the long run to continue to expand would be, in this case, as this graph is showing, is get more capital expand your building size, expand your amount of capital. And what it does is it shifts your marginal productivity curve up as you increase the fixed input and allows your maximized point to go ever higher. Which basically is the way that a developing country becomes a developed country. That the United States became the developed country that it is by building up capital through savings and investment. It allowed us to have machines and buildings and warehouses and factories and assembly lines that made those workers more and more productive. Okay, again, I'm going to skip examples because um, I just don't think you really need them. Uh, although I will talk about this one because it is a it is one we hear about quite a bit. <coughs> Thomas Malthus, back in the um, 18th and 19th century, basically was a person that said, we're going to run out of things. That The world's going to go hungry because we've got too many people and not enough food, uh, land to grow that food. So he predicted everyone's going to die off. It didn't happen. Because the th the the what he had said basically Malthus had said was okay we have <coughs> let's say uh, three hundred million people we have to feed around the world we only have x amount of land. And X amount of land produces Y amount of food. Well, what did he fail to take into account? Well, in that case, right, if we set this up as a function, right, he basically said Y was going to reach some certain limit. And our capital was basically fixed. That would be the amount of land, let's say, that we have. Well, what he failed to take into account is the fact that the technology can change. That's exactly what we see here, right? The family farm doesn't really exist anymore in the United States. It's been replaced by, right, uh, companies that buy the right seeds and buy the right tractors and, uh, you know, charge the right prices as they store the product that they're producing. Um, to be able to produce more food at cheaper prices. Is it a bad thing that we've lost the family farmer? Not really. Um, <laughs> our food prices are among the cheapest in the world. Um, the fact that people go hungry in the United States 
it's not because we're not growing enough food and we don't have food to feed them. It's really more a consequence of lack of compensation um, for workers to be able to uh, buy anything. We have, we grow more food than we possibly need. Okay, so. Sorry. Um, so you can see that here. Prices of foods declining. Okay, so what we know is that our our labor productivity is important for determining things in terms of how much it can be produced and the way that a country can grow, the way that we get that additional labor productivity is two ways. Having more capital and having a better way to combine the capital with the labor. That's basically the, the essence of development economics, if you've ever taken one of those um, upper level courses. How a country can grow to be bigger, like China. How did China grow? Well, in China's case, right, it was technological change. Yes, absolutely. Investments in the stock of capital, but also an attempt to increase labor productivity by stopping people from having too many babies, right, which would then allow the scarce capital to be spread across um, fewer workers. <clears throat> and we see this um, kind of thing here where we can see that when a company or when a country has productive workers, they can produce quite a bit. And that's what we see definitely here. And even though this data is from 2010, um, that in the United States, because of the capital that we have, workers are quite productive. And what that means is that the standard of living here in the United States is, is quite high compared to other countries. Okay, and as I skip a slide, it just basically means that we don't really need to talk about it. Um, it's not that important. Okay, now, We've been having a discussion so far where one of the inputs is fixed and the other is variable. Where things now change in our discussion is what happens in the long run. What happens when both inputs are completely variable? So now the question is a lot more difficult for the firm because now it has to pick both the amount of labor and the amount of capital. <coughs> we need to calculate isoquants, that would be, as it says, well, I'm not going to rewrite what it says here. That would be the combinations of the inputs that yield the same output. So it's kind of like our indifference curve, except this is for the firm. Remember, the indifference curve, it was the same amount of utility, different quantities of the two products. So what we can see here is that um, for these five units of capital, sorry, for these five units of, um, what, uh, I'm thinking this graph is off in some way, because how would that, Uh, let's see here. Yeah, I mean, it just must be off because one of these, I'm thinking this is referring to capital and I'm thinking this is referring to the labor. Doesn't matter. Basically, we have a more capital intensive, let's say, this is one worker, five capital. They can be used to produce 75 units of output. Another one, let's say it's two workers, 
right? Assuming this is workers. And three capital. Let's just skip this one here. And then wonder where it's more labor intensive. So five workers, one capital. These are all different combinations that produce the same amount of output, an isoquant. And what we see here, right, is that for the same level of output, you could again imagine different units, different combinations of labor and capital that produce 75 units. And they would all be along this curve. <coughs> um, and what we can do is we can see, interestingly, we can see that if I kept something fixed like capital, it's going to become less productive over time. Look at what happens from A to B. If we keep capital fixed, the workers are going to get more crowded around those three units of capital. And so now I'm going from 55. So right before it was from zero to 55. So the marginal product increased by 55, marginal product of labor. Now the marginal product of labor is 20 because it's going from 55 to 75. And then it becomes 15 because it's going from 75 to 90. That's all keeping the amount of capital per year fixed at three. Oh, and I guess, <laughs> again, if I had read it, it says that right here as well, what I just said. So basically, the isoquants are getting squished together, essentially. <coughs> and so what that does is it highlights the importance of keeping the amount of um, the amounts for both inputs flexible, because once you start fixing something in size, that's where you start to see that change in. Um, um, the marginal productivity of the input. And that's essentially what's being said here. Um, man, that looks like a horrible looking slide. Does it look better over here? Sorry, this is the PPF, or the PowerPoint. Yeah, that doesn't look any better. That doesn't look any better either. Okay, well, um, let's just rewrite this. So now the slope of the isoquant is the marginal rate of technical substitution. Which is essentially the negative ratio of the marginal productivity of labor over the marginal productivity of capital. It's negative because it's downward sloping. That's just a simple way of, of, of reducing down all that they say right there. So what you can see here um, in this graph, let's zoom in on this here. <coughs> and then let's erase this. So we get rid of all that. Essentially, what we see here is that as we move the slope of that isoquant is the marginal rate of technical substitution. And we can see that um, in this case here, you're going from changing by um, two units of capital for one unit of labor, 
one to one, two thirds to one, one third to one. That along the MRTS, is getting flatter and flatter as you go from left to right. And the reason why that's happening is because that input is becoming less and less productive. That essentially What's happening as you go from left to right is you got too many workers. <clears throat> You're getting an imbalance. Yes, you can produce something with a worker intensive production model versus a capital productive uh, capital intensive production model and still produce the same amount, 75 units. But at the right and extreme, you've got so many workers doing it. You got you got too many workers, basically. If you were to use just a little bit of capital, your capital would be very, very productive. So the outside of those two standard production functions, the only other thing we can um, do here is we can look at, um, I guess, what we call the special cases, which would be um, uh, a yeah, perfect substitutes or a linear production function. And then we can look at a fixed proportions production function, which would be a, a Leon TF um, sort of production model. So let's start with. Um, perfect substitutes. So this would be saying that the labor and capital are um, perfect substitutes for one another in producing that output. Well, then our marginal rate of technical substitution is constant. It wouldn't change based on um, how much labor or capital you had because it's always replaceable, let's say, one for one. Um, I mean, it can happen. Um, I mean, stores would like to think that the self-checkout lane, you know, is just as um, productive as the lines where you've got a worker doing things. Or, you know, like those Amazon factories you see where, like, you know, robots are, like, moving everything around, that those are just as productive as workers. And, but you kind of need both, I guess, at some point. So having perfect substitutes in production is pretty rare. You'd be more often, you would see something where it's fixed proportions. So, right, federal guidelines dictate that, you know, if you're flying in an airplane, you need a certain number of flight attendants for a certain number of passengers. And you have to have a pilot and a co-pilot. So, you know, you need at least two people in the cockpit of the plane to go flying around. You could add more if you want, but then that guy's just going to be sitting in the other seat, you know, talking about baseball or, I don't know, or how pretty the sky looks. You're not going to be, like, talking about actually flying the plane. Same with flight attendants. Yeah, you could add more, but that person's going to be reading old magazines. So, but you also can't have less. Right? You can't have just a pilot. That would be illegal. And then the plane maybe couldn't fly or wouldn't fly as productively. You could have fewer flight attendants, but then you'd be, again, breaking the law. So what you see with, these, with this Leon TF technology, where it's L-shaped, you have only certain combinations then that are desirable. You wouldn't want to have... You can't have less because in most cases then it's illegal and you can't have more or you don't want to have more because it's not going to add anything to your production.
Okay, again, I'll skip um, our examples here. And what that takes us to then is our returns to scale. And in our returns to scale, we're looking at what happens to our outputs when we change our inputs. And really what we're looking at here is what happens when we double, for instance, or um, triple something um, in terms of our inputs. How does that contribute to changing our outputs? So increasing returns to scale would mean if we double our inputs, do we get double the outputs? Constant returns to scale. Sorry, so increasing returns to scale would mean we get double the out, more than double the output when we double our inputs. Constant returns to scale would just say double to double, right? Double inputs, double output. And then decreasing returns to scale would mean that we double our inputs and we get less than double our output. Basically, we're looking at the distance between the isoquants. Um, I, I don't want to like belabor this. I don't want to make this more complicated than it needs to be. But it really is about spacing. And you can see that here. So in constant returns of scale, as you can see in panel A, the isoquants are equally spaced from each other. When there's increasing returns to scale, the isoquants get bunched up together. And then we're going to see that with decreasing returns to scale, they get further and further apart. Although for some reason, they decided not to show us that picture. But they would get spread out further and further. Okay. Um, where you'll see a lot of this, or the interesting stuff about this chapter, is actually when we get to the... Um, problem set, and you'll see that in the video I make about the um, uh, problem set.